Bibles. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, I want to preach for just a few minutes tonight. Uh, age kind of being our topic and our theme. And uh, it's never a good one, I know, to, uh, to really draw a, a sermon title from. And uh, so, so I struggled a little bit on, on how to conduct this service and what message to preach on a night like this. But I believe that the Lord has spoken to my heart. And he spoke to me out of one of my favorite chapters in, in the whole book, or the whole Bible. And uh, really the whole book of Matthew because I, I got a lot of favorites. But Matthew chapter 6 and 33 is, happens to be my favorite verse. And, uh, and then I was reading there and, and read on into chapter 7 and, and the Lord dealt with my heart and, and I love Matthew chapter 7. And listen, we're going to le- read a small part of it tonight, but I challenge you to go home and read the entire chapter of Matthew chapter 7 and you're going to find some, some good instruction and some good words of wisdom to live by. And uh, so let's look at a few of them tonight. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 is where I'd like to start. It's written in red in my Bible, which means that Jesus actually spoke these words and And Matthew, being the the kind gentleman that he was, uh, took out a pen and paper and wrote this down, uh, what Jesus was saying. And here's what Jesus says. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. And only few there be that find it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this occasion tonight, Lord. We thank you for this service. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to open up your pages of the love letter that you wrote to us and to look at it, God, to examine it and try to apply it to our lives. And the truth, Jesus, that you spoke over 2,000 years ago, Lord, we know that it's still very much relevant in our lives today. And help us to find that truth, God. Help us to live by that truth. Help us to accept the truth. And help us, Lord, never to forget it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing and reading the word of God with us. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be which go therein. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads unto life. And only few there be that finds that way. Now this is a scripture that many of us have learned Uh, from toddler age up and uh, we've been acquainted with the fact that life in fact has two roads and uh, one road or one way as the scripture calls it uh, the Bible says that broad is the way and that wide is the gate but this road we know ultimately ends the Bible says in destruction and in death in eternal damnation And the Bible says there's also another road or another way, and that is a way with a straight gate or a very uh, uh, narrow gate and also a narrow way. So the path is narrow as well. And some people have accused people of being narrow-minded, but uh, how many of you know that you got to have kind of a narrow mind to walk on a narrow path and down a narrow way? Amen? And uh, I'm all about mega churches and churches growing just as full as, as they can get and building and growing again. And, and I'm all for that, but I'm not for that at the cost of godly principles and at the cost of the written word of God and the laws and the standards that God has. Amen? Because these standards apply to everyone across the board. And so there's two roads tonight in which you and I are living. There's two paths that everyone in here are walking on. There's only two options. It's a road that's broad with a gate that's wide and there's a whole lot of people on that road. And that's a road of sin. And the Bible says that road is going to one day lead to destruction. And I'd like to pause right here because I believe if we had a healthy understanding of sin, then there'd be very few of us actually committing sin. If we had a healthy understanding and concept of sin, then... We would want to do everything in our power not to sin. And instead of seeing how close we can get to the edge without falling off or how close we can get to the line without crossing over or how close we can get to this sin without it actually being called sin, we'd be wanting to stay just as far away as possible if we had a healthy understanding of what sin is. What is a healthy understanding of what sin is? Sin is death. Sin equals death. Every ramification of the term, every way you can define it, every way you can look at it, every way you can analyze it, sin ends up equaling death. 
You cannot sin without there being death. You cannot commit sin without there being death. It is not possible for sin not to bring about death. Amen. That's not my truth. That's not my theology. That's written in the pages of the Word of God. The wages of sin. Does sin pay? Yeah, sin pays. Is sin fun? Yeah, the Bible says sin's fun for us. But the wages of sin, the end thereof, is the ways of death. There has to be death accompanying every sin. There has to be a death accompanying every sin. That's not happy, I know. It's not good news, I know. The good news is there's another way. (laughs) The good news is you don't have to travel that road. Yeah, a lot of your friends are on that road, and and yes, sin is pleasurable for a season, and and yes, sin has its payday at times, but the end is death. And the good news tonight is there's another way. (laughs) There's another road. There's another gate. (laughs) Amen. There's another path you can travel. And the Bible says that this path, It's a narrow path. The gate's very straight, the Bible calls it. And and the path is very narrow. And the Bible says something that really disturbs me. And it says that only few is going to find this path. Only few is going to find this way. This kind of goes against the, the common mechanisms today in the church world as to everybody's welcome and everybody's going to make it to heaven. And everybody serving whatever God they serve is going to be able to call heaven their home one day. And the Bible just says that is not true. Straight is a gate. What's that mean? In reality, there's only one way to get there, friend. And His name is Jesus Christ. Not many gods lead to our great big heaven. No, only one God leads to our great big heaven. Not many ways to get there. No, there's only one way. It's an easy road. No, the Bible says it's straight and it's narrow. And it has rules. It has consequences. It has standards that we must live by. But the Bible says the end thereof is life. (laughs) Oh, man, I believe you. That, that Billy Graham has preached his entire life. And, and you know what he says when he gets in those crusades? He, he doesn't say all, all kinds of fancy stuff and, and use big theological terms. And even when he does, he's preaching a very simple gospel, friend. And that very simple gospel is that there's two avenues. There's two roads that you can be walking. One leads to destruction and the other leads to life. And how many of you know if I go up to anybody and say, do you want to die or do you want to live? Every single time somebody's going to say, I want want to live. Tell me how to live. The world and all the sin that they're committing friend is just trying to live day by day. The business world as crooked as they are are just trying to live and earn a living. And I'm telling you that if we'll get our facts straight if we'll get our gospel straight if we'll get our Jesus straight we understand that the only way to life is this narrow road living as Jesus as our personal Savior. And if we'll sell that message friend and say, listen, the only way you can live eternally is with Jesus Christ as your Savior. Who would turn us down? Amen? Who would say no? When you say, do you want to die or do you want to live? Very simple message. One of the most simplest messages that I believe can be summed up in two phrases. That is that God loves you and sin will kill you. God loves you and sin will kill you. Amen? Oh, you might want to write that down. God loves you sin will kill you. Words to live by for the rest of your life. Verse 15 says, why is it that there's going to be so many on this road that leads to destruction? If we understand that the end is death, then how are so many people deceived? Does anyone want to choose death? No. If you had the choice of life and death, why everyone's going to choose life? Then how is it so many people end up on the road to destruction. Well, number one, did you know that the majority of the world's population, contrary to what we may think, doesn't live in America? Amen? The majority of the world's population lives in other countries across the seas. And while we sit playing on our Nintendos and while we sit watching our television and while we sit reading our books, there's countless, countless, countless individuals that are living and dying without ever knowing that there's been a payment for their sins. 
without ever knowing that there's a God that loves them and a Jesus that died for them. They never have the opportunity to know. What happens to people that don't know Jesus? They go to hell. What happens to people that have never heard the good news? They can't make it in this straight gate, in this narrow way, in this place called heaven. So whose responsibility is that? It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. Amen? I don't mean to point finger. It's my responsibility. And it's your responsibility. Who's supposed to tell them? We are. Who has to preach to them? We do. Who has to send missionaries to go to them? We do. It's our job. It's our responsibility. Boss Von Road and the House of Prayer Church wasn't erected to just sit here as a place where you can come and enjoy a place of freedom from the elements of the weather. Amen? It wasn't just erected for you to come and take a load off your feet and enjoy padded seats. Amen? There's a purpose behind it. There's a mission behind it. And all of you I know have bought into that mission and you want to see great things accomplished right here at the house of prayer. And that's the theme of our message tonight. That is the best is yet to come. Dad has celebrated 50 years here on this planet, but I'm come to tell him tonight that his best years are still ahead of him. That the biggest achievements are still yet to be achieved, friend. And I've come to tell the house of prayer, your best days lie ahead of you and the choices you make and the decisions you make and what you do with your faith and what you do with your message where you place your money where you place your time where you place your energy and your efforts it's going to matter friend and the good news tonight is you haven't already arrived and you're not living in yesterday but, but God's got a future and God's got a plan and God's got somewhere to take you and to take this church and dad to take Amen. Woo, that's good news tonight. How are so many people to deceive? Because there's an enemy out there. And his job is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And the Bible says he walks around all the time as a roaring lion just looking and seeking whom he may devour. And Jesus told the disciples, said, I want you to be weary because this dude, this rascal, this devil, he wants to sift you as well. He gave us a warning that there's an enemy that hates us. That wants to destroy us. Now I can understand that and I can wrap my mind around it. But the fact is he doesn't always come as a killer. And he doesn't always show up at my doorstep as a thief. Oftentimes he tries to sneak in as someone who actually cares about me. Someone who has my best interest in mind. Or something that's enjoyable for a time. But the end thereof is hidden from me, so I can't see the destruction. Many people are deceived by the, by the cunningness of Satan himself. And the devices and the tricks that he has to paint a pretty picture in our, in our minds. And on the TV screens and in the movie theaters. To teach us and to train us and mold us and shape our minds that this is okay. and This is acceptable. And this can now be tolerated. And he twists the congregations of our churches and the leaders of those churches and the leaders of our country to remove Ten Commandments that say thou shalt not kill and, and thou shalt not commit adultery and, and thou shalt not steal and, and thou shalt not bear false witness and lie. Why do you want to remove those? Because of the first two and that is there shall be no other God before you and don't make any graven images. Because of the first, take those two off and they'll still post the other rules, right? Because no one wants to kill, steal, and to destroy or to be killed or to be stolen from or to be lied about. But some people have an issue with him being the only God and him being the only ticket to heaven. But I'm here to tell you, it's the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's the gospel. It's truth. So the enemy's out there, yeah, and he's twisting things, contorting things, and, and painting pretty pictures when, when the picture isn't pretty at all. Sin is never pretty. And when you crack into that thing and you look at the guts of sin, I promise you, it doesn't look pretty. I know that girl looks pretty right now, but if you do the things she asks you to do, it's, it's not going to end up pretty. And the boy looks real stunning right now, but if you give in to his pressure and you do the things he's asking you to, I promise the end isn't pretty. Amen. 
Well, somebody ought to be saying amen. Come on. There's an enemy that wants to kill us, to steal us, to destroy us. I can understand that. There's going to be a lot on that broad road because there's an enemy that hates me. But not only that, verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Why else are so many people going to be deceived? Because there's a lot of wolves dressed up in sheep's clothing that are leading our churches, that are teaching our Sunday school classes, that are working in our children's ministry, that are hold offices in the church and they're nothing but wolves dressed in sheep's clothing and Jesus called them out many many times while he was on this planet he called them things like hypocrites and, and things like vipers and all kinds of heathens and other terminology we can see because they're nothing but wolves dressed in sheep's clothing to try to mingle with, with the sheep and can I tell you that a shepherd I believe it was dad that says this a shepherd that doesn't smell like sheep isn't worthy of being followed. Amen? A shepherd that doesn't smell like sheep isn't worthy of being followed because a true shepherd's going to lead the sheep and he's going to be in there picking up those sheep. One of the duties of a shepherd is when the sheep falls over, a sheep can't do like you and I and just get back up on its own. It needs somebody to come and flip it back on to its feet. And how many of you know in pastoral leadership there's a duty and that is some of your sheep are going to fall over and some of them are going to fall down. Some of them are going to end up on their backside and you just put them back up last week and you thought they were going to run the race, man, and they're going to fall over. And you as a pastor, it's not to scorn them and it's not to scoff at them and it's not to criticize them. And you as church members, it's not to laugh at them and kick them while they're down. No, it's a group effort to come alongside of that sheep and say, I know it's all right, you're going to fall over at time. I'm going to pick you up and set you back up and give you four feet to stand on again. Amen. Amen. I'll hold you here a while until you get your feet and back under you because we got to finish this race. we gotta, we got to get there to the end, man. we got to do this thing. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You're going to know them. How do I know them? You're going to know them by the fruit that they bear. Do men gather grapes, thorns, or figs, or thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Okay, I understand it. So now I understand that God's now used, or Jesus has used two different types of symbolism here, and I'm trying to keep track. First of all, he's referred to us as believers as sheep, right? And, and that's not really, really good because if you knew the brain size of a sheep, <laughs> we'd all be saying, wow. And uh, all the shepherds across the land are all saying, yeah, I understand the brain size <laughs> of a sheep. But, but nonetheless, Jesus referred to us as sheep more so than anything because a sheep knows its shepherd's voice. <laughs> Did you know that? A sheep knows the shepherd's voice. It knows when it's in the presence of someone that's going to care for it. And it also knows a wolf when it's in the midst. And we as sheep we got to know the difference amen we got to know when someone cares for us and when someone's causing to come to cause division and we, we got to separate ourselves so first of all he refers to us as sheep and can I tell you that only sheep produce sheep only sheep produce sheep. It's your job to fill these pews. It's your job to bring in co-workers and friends and family. As hard as dad tries and all the hours he puts into it, he'll never be able to produce sheep. Why? Because he's a shepherd. Amen. And it's not the shepherd's job to produce sheep. The sheep have to produce sheep. Amen. Ouch, I know. <laughs> but amen. We've got to produce our own. Here we are in this workforce, and here we are in our families, and here we are surrounded by all these people that don't know Jesus. And do we think it's by accident, luck, or chance? Absolutely not. Do we think God's laughing at us because he's placed us in a workforce with everybody in there as unbelievers? No. Well, God's got a sense of humor. Look where I have to work, and I have to hear this. God, did you ever stop to think maybe he'd done that intentionally and on purpose and said, this is your mission field. Hey, congratulations. You don't have to go to Africa. You don't have to go to Indonesia or Micronesia, but you can work right here at Low Sporting Goods or right here at White House clinic. You get the best job in the world. You don't even have to travel but you're commuting back and forth to work every day. Welcome to your mission field. Amen. It's our duty. It's our job to produce sheep. Secondly, he refers to us as trees. Well, what's my duty as a tree? 
Well, it's certainly not to just bear leaves, and it's certainly not to wither away, it's certainly not to dry up and die. But God's got big plans for all the trees that are in this room. And if you've made Him your Lord and Savior and you're trying to live for Him, rest assured you're a tree tonight. And I don't mean that harshly or I don't mean that foolishly, but I mean that Jesus refers to us as trees. Here in verse 17, even so every good tree brings forth good fruit and a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. I didn't say it, the Bible did. A good tree can't bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Can't be done. It's not possible. Glendale, I mean, you got a lot in common, and that is that I was raised planting gardens, and I was raised tilling the ground and, and planting plants, and I, I'm confident that no matter how many times I planted a tomato plant in the ground, come harvest time a few months down the road, I'm never, ever, ever going to get sweet potatoes ever, from that tomato plant. And when I plant a a sweet potato plant or a peanut plant or whatever it may be, I'm never, ever, ever from that plant going to reap a tomato. It's not possible. So God says you're one of two kinds of trees. You're a good tree or you're a corrupt tree. And it's easy to tell which one you are. As a matter of fact, tonight you can examine your own lives. And that is a good tree is bringing forth good, vibrant, juicy, nice-looking fruit. And a corrupt tree is bringing forth nothing. You can look around and you have no fruit to show from your efforts, for your church attendance, for your daily Bible reading, for your prayer. If there's no fruit to show, then that tells us we're a corrupt tree. And that's not me harping at you, that's the Bible. And us reading these scriptures, right? A corrupt tree doesn't produce fruit. But a good tree will always produce fruit. As a matter of fact, it's not possible for a good tree to produce bad fruit. Amen? Or to not produce fruit at all. Well, Brad, I'm just one of these type of Christians that don't like to get radical about things and I don't like to approach people and, and share my faith with them. Well, you're a tree, but you're a tree that's not producing fruit. And the Bible calls that a corrupt tree. I didn't say it, it did. Look, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Verse 19, but every tree, every tree that brings forth no fruit is going to be hewn down and cast into the fire. Every tree that produces nothing is good for nothing. It's going to be cut down. It's going to be cast into the fire. Here's the good news tonight, friend. God in his infinite wisdom while he was creating this planet and everything that we see in the universe and the stars and he was putting it all into place over a span of seven days six and then he rested on the seventh but while he was doing all that he didn't look down in the year 2011 and start picking and choosing who's going to be good trees and who's going to be bad trees and set that into motion and now it's unstoppable and now it can't be changed the good news is we're in control of what kind of tree we are the good news is I decide if I want to have juicy apples hanging from my tree. The good news is you decide if you want to be a non-producing tree or if you want to bear fruit. Amen? If you want to be a sheep that doesn't produce another sheep or if you want to be a sheep that has just as many babies as you can. Amen? It's your choice. It's your decision. And my challenge to the house of prayer tonight is that your best days are still ahead of you. What's it going to take, Brad, for us to reach our greatest moments, our greatest achievements, to do more than we've ever done before? A few things it's going to take, okay? Number one, you've got to believe that you can. You have to believe that you are, you are living for God and, and you're going to accomplish what God has to plan for you and that, that your brightest days are still ahead. And I didn't ask you to believe that you alone can do it, but I ask you to believe believe that it can be done and working with other people working with other churches working with other ministries working with the community in which we live we can accomplish great things number one I have to believe my best days are still ahead of me I have to believe that God's not done with me that I'm not just washed up anymore but God has still got a purpose a destiny a plan for my life and as a matter of fact the very best moments of my life are still ahead I have to believe 
You have to believe. Amen. Number one, I've got to believe. Number two, I have to think, and you have to think outside the box. And I mean that two ways. Number one, you've got to think outside of the four walls of this church. Amen. We have to take our message outside these walls into the world and say, hey world, there's a God that loves you and there's a Jesus that died for you and he wants to forgive you of all your sin. We gotta go to them and we gotta win them. We gotta produce fruit. We gotta choose to do that. We have to think outside of the box. The second way I mean to think outside of the box is that we gotta think extraordinary things. We got to believe God for supernatural movements and supernatural abilities. What are you talking about, Brad? I'm talking about the size of this church may not be conducive for some of the ministry that you can dream up and brainstorm in your mind. But if you can dream it up and you can brainstorm it and God can put it in your heart, friend, God will get it done. Amen. <laughs> I mean, the budget may not be conducive for some of the things that you can brainstorm and dream and envision yourself or this church doing, but if God can place it in your heart, don't you think that that same God can get it done? Hallelujah. And can place it in the hearts of others to help you get it done. Yeah. Think outside the box. Think big picture. Stop thinking normality. Everybody is the same way I am. And everybody does things like this. And it's just impossible. It can't. Well, hogwash, man. What if the 12 disciples would have done that after Christ done went and left them? Oh, there's a whole world to be reached. There's no way, man. We're far outnumbered. No one's going to believe us and believe our story. And the very first time Peter goes up and opens his mouth and starts telling the story, 3,000 people come and they say, Peter, man, we got to have this Jesus that you're telling us about. <laughs> it can be done. Don't tell me, and most importantly, don't tell God that it can't be done. If he's spoken to your heart and he's given you a vision, he's placed a call in your life, it can and it will be done through and by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not by my might and not by my power and not by your might and not by your power, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He has to stand behind his word and he has to stand behind the word that he placed into your heart. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your vision, on the mission statement of the church. Reach it, achieve it, go for it. Your brightest future is still ahead. The best days have yet to come for the house of prayer. In order to do that, we've got to believe. We've got to think outside the box. Number three, this is a tough one. We've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to put our shoulder to the plow. And we have to do some old bad word work. W-O-R-K. I know. No amens. <laughs> that says, Brad, the food's waiting outside and we got to go. No one likes talking about work, but it has to be done, friend. If there's a field to be plowed, there has to be someone that gets behind that plow and plows the field. If there's people to be fed, there has to be someone willing to man the kitchens and cook the food and get the people fed. People have to be brought to church. There has to be people willing to get behind the wheel of a church bus and drive that bus like it's their very mission purpose for yes, being here is. on this planet. And it yes, is. It is. Amen. There's work to be done. Well, what's my reward for working, Brad? Here's the good news. I know because you were in bad and bad spirits when I mentioned the word work. What's the reward for working? More work. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't stop, friend. You don't go pick up one bus load next Sunday and say, all right, now my job is over, man. I'm checking out of this planet. No, it doesn't happen. You're here. You're here to work. And the reward for working, guess what? It's going to double your work. And then you're going to work even harder to get that double work done. And then your work's going to triple. Then you're going to work. But before you know it, you look back and there's a whole bushel of trees. And there's a whole hillside of fruit that's just hanging and vibrant and juicy. And the whole world can see it. And it all started because some people at the house of prayer said, I'm willing to work. And I'm willing to think outside of the box. And I'm willing to believe. And I'm willing to do my part. 
And when it's all said and done, I'm willing to get in there and do my part again. Even when I'm tired, I'm willing to get in there and do it again. Even when I don't see results, I'm willing to get in and give it my best effort. Every Sunday school teacher and every preacher and every singer ought to be clapping and thanking God. Because guess what? Not one ounce of work, not one ounce of energy you ever spend goes unrewarded. Goes unrewarded, none of it. Oh, yo, you're never going to see anybody up here keeping record and keeping score. <laughs> Not too many people you're going to come in contact. Lindell's going to pull out the roll list and say, Glenn, I saw you get up early and pray, and I, I saw you go and, and fix food for those kids, and I saw you go and drive a bus and pick them up, and I saw you do this, and I saw you do that, and we just want to have a service to praise you. This is not going to happen. <laughs> but the Bible says there's a roll being kept in heaven. But I don't know a lot of the things that are up there, but I do know there's a scorecard being kept. <laughs> I do know that there's a book that's being written in every moment and every second of every day. <laughs> and I know my name's in that book. And I know he's paying attention to every time I, I put my shoulder to the plow and I, I give it another day and I give it another try and I get in and I give it my best effort. He's taking note and he's keeping. And one day on what day? That day that every one of us are, are scheduled to, 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 to be at. And that day when we stand before him in the clouds of glory, we see him face to face. There's two judgments. The first judgment is for those people I was talking about at the beginning that had two roads to live on. Heaven or hell. Life or death. Your judgment's going to be, did you accept Christ, did you not? For those that did accept Christ... You get another judgment. You're going to be judged. Guess what? For the work that you've done. For the work that you've done. It never seems to matter. It never seems to count. It never pays off. I never see fruit. On that day, you're going to look back and say, boy, it was all worth it. On that day, there's going to be a whole lot of us standing there and saying, can I go do that over? Because I'd give it 110% next time. I'd do it a lot better next time. I'd sign that sign-up sheet for that volunteer list next time. Boy, I would have participated. Can I go do it over? As our works are tried and burned by fire, the Bible says the good ones are going to stand the test. They're going to shine like gold and he's going to mold those into a crown and you're going to wear that crown and then be able to display it back at his feet. And the works that we missed out on, the opportunities we said no to, the times when we were too busy and we said, God, this just can't be done. Or, you're calling someone else to volunteer this week. You've you, you got to use someone else, Lord. All those times are going to be dissipated. They're going to be burned like wood, hay, and stubble. They're just going to vanish and disappear. Nothing to be rewarded for. I don't know about you, but I want all the rewards in heaven that I can possibly get. I want the finest home he has built. And I want all the rewards that he has to hand out. I want every single one of them. I don't want to miss out on them.